Welcome everyone. Welcome to Sit Heads Meditation Club. My name is John. I organize this group. Uh, Sit Heads is a sitting and social group for people interested in deep meditation practice. Everything we do is free and donation based. If you want to hang out with us, uh, you can find us at sit heads.com. Uh, every now and then we have a guest teacher join us and Tonight, we are very lucky to have with us the incredible Shyla Kathryn. Uh, Shyla, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm really glad to have you with us. So I'm going to give you a little introduction, if that's okay. Great. So Shyla Kathryn. Shyla has been practicing meditation since 1980. She has done more than nine years of silent meditation retreat. Uh, that's a lot. Shyla has studied with a number of uh, great meditation masters uh, across Asia, uh, including the uh, Advaita Vedanta teacher H.W.L. Kunja, um, the Tibetan masters Yosho Ken Rinpoche and Tolku Ergen Rinpoche, um, and uh, great Western teachers like Christopher Titmus and Joseph Goldstein, one of my personal favorite teachers. Uh, Shyla spent a lot of time uh, studying under the Burmese master Pa Ok Sayadaw. She did a one year intensive meditation retreat with him with a focus on uh, concentration and jhana. Uh, let's see. But Shyla is also, I think, authorized to teach his uh, Pa Ok's Vipassana practice as well. Uh, Shyla founded Insight Meditation South Bay. She also founded the online meditation classroom Bodhi Courses, uh, which you can find at bodhicourses.org. Uh, let's see. She wrote a couple great books. She wrote Focused and Fearless, uh, which is a guide to samatha, concentration, and jhana practice. There it is. Um, and also Wisdom Wide and Deep. A there, there it is, a practical handbook for mastering jhana and vipassana. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and put us up on the, on the little spotlight thing, if that's okay. So uh, I do want to mention that Shyla offers online courses about, I haven't taken one yet, but I've heard fantastic things about them from friends, and I think I might take the next one. Uh, she offers online courses, I think, two or three times a year through her platform, bodhicourses.org. Shyla, is there anything that you'd like to say before we get started? Um, no, thank you for the wonderful introduction. I look forward to our conversation. Yeah, me too. So Shyla, I have um, three questions that I really wanna get to, but if we don't make it to all of them, it's not the end of the world. So, but I'm, I'm sort of setting my goals at the outset. All right. so. My first question, Shyla, and by the way, feel free during this conversation to, you know, uh, push back, throw a question back at me. It doesn't have to be sort of strict Q&A. You know, it can, it can be a sort of organic discussion if that's how it plays out. So, all right, here's my first question uh, that I'd love for us to talk about. Do you have any advice on how to avoid, in meditation, striving for states, stages, attainments, you know, when you're doing a style of practice that has some sort of defined endpoint that you're aiming toward, right? You might be practicing to achieve jhana, right? Meditative absorption, or you might be doing vipassana practice and aiming for stream entry, the first stage or subsequent stages of awakening. There are, in a sense, goals. And I think, you know, a lot of people have found, and certainly I have found, that it's all too easy to fall into the trap of getting very strivy and goal-oriented, and it's not good for the practice. So do you have thoughts um, on how to, yeah, how to, how to not fall into that trap? It, this is something that I think about a lot because I really appreciate and value um, systematic practices. I do think there's a lot of value for understanding the way that a, a practice unfolds, the trajectory and the uh, purpose and aim of our practice. So I do um, 
I do feel that there is a purpose, <laughs> there is a goal, and there certainly is an aim for engaging in Dharma practice. I think the Buddha taught a very clear goal, uh, the experience, the realization of, um, of liberation, which is the mind freed from the defilements an ending of greed, hate, and delusion. And I think that is a very worthy goal, well worth spending a lot of time cultivating. But it's not necessarily something that we're going to be able to measure um, on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> or on a retreat-to-retreat -retreat basis. It's also not necessarily something that, um, um, you know, that we, can, uh, that we can identify with. I am free of defilements. That's a little weird. <laughs> it sort of indicates if there's a strong I that we're not actually free from the defilements. So when we're, when we're finding any tension or judgment around the goals of practice, to me, it doesn't mean that there's a problem with having with, with the goals of practice or the, the purpose of the, of the path, but there's very likely um, some degree of eye making and mind making or conceit going on. If it's inferiority conceit, we could fall into the trap of being disillusioned, despairing, self-judging, feeling discouraged or disappointed that we're not accomplishing what we should. And then in, in that kind of discouragement, we might people might lash out and get angry and blame the teacher or the teachings or the system or, or look for something easy or, or redefine the, the practices so that it can conform to our, um, you know, our, our conform to our experience. Um, and if it's superiority conceit, then we can have the arrogance that things we've accomplished perhaps a lot more than we actually have, or perhaps have even the arrogance to, to think that we have completed some, uh, some stages or steps on the path long before we have actually completed them. So um, I, I think we have to hold this as an as a ongoing question in our practice, not about where am I on the practice, path because that's the corruption whether it's towards the inferiority or the superiority conceit and not where you are in terms of judging another you know sometimes people will ask oh is this teacher or that person awakened are they a stream enterer how many arhats do you know you know those kinds of questions it, that's the same kind of judging comparing conceit oriented movement. And I think all of that we have to be mindful of and let go. But when we're not engaged in a lot of that stuff, um, then we can have a great aspiration, a sense of the potential of the path and know that it unfolds systematically or somewhat sequentially and engage in different practices where as we uh, get kind of some degree of mastery or ease or have some sense of accomplishment at one level, that should make the next step easy. So it gives us a way to guide our practice because if we've accomplished one thing and we've developed those skills or had those insights and experiences or experienced that kind of a state, it creates the conditions that lead to the next one. There doesn't need to be the reinforcement of any self-boasting or self-flagellation in the process, but it can help us sense whether or not this mind-body system is ready to undertake the next step or stage or, 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 or sense of the practice. It also can help us not stop short of the goal because there's an ongoing um, kind of wonder that happens in practice where we have experiences we've never had before. Um, experiences of joy and happiness that are more exquisite than anything we've known before. States of peace that we've never known. So that were even possible before. And that should happen many, 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 many times. In fact, that's what happens with insight. And that's what happens with growth. Each amazing experience that we have 
does not necessarily mean we have another stage or state that falls onto a spiritual map of samadhi or vipassana. So, but many people, since it's so wonderful, they just learn something and it was awesome or experience something that was profound. Um, sometimes the mind wants to um, kind of scramble to make it into something, conceive of it as something, find it on the, on the path, and then identify I am there, and to try to somehow feel like that the self is confirmed in that process. And sometimes people then stop there, rather than realize, wow, there was something that uh, 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 it was unknown and now is known. And that opens the possibility for the next learning and the next development and the next experience that we cultivate or, 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 or move forward on this, um, on this spiritual journey. So I do think there's a lot of danger in terms of getting stuck and in terms of judging and in terms of identifying with the position. So I think we just have to be wise about our practice and keep looking for where we're identifying, where we're clinging, where the ego is all bent out of shape um, and see that, that's, that there's some problem there, there's some tension there, there's some identification and clinging that we can loosen up so that we can then um, experience the benefits of a systematic unfolding of a method or the benefits of a, of a surprisingly well-defined purpose for this practice. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's interesting because, first of all, I appreciate that you so completely acknowledge, yeah, there's a goal. Let's, let's you know, there, and there are stages. Um, I wonder, do you think that um, the student do you think it does more harm than good for a student to actually have the map to know about the stages or do you think that's okay and even or and and more helpful than harmful it goes both ways it can um um I don't think ignorance is necessarily bliss. <laughs> and um, I also think that the information is available and it would surprise me somewhat if people went for uh, decades of their practice and didn't um, learn about the, some of the more common stages like the stages of awakening. Um, so I don't think, I mean, in a, in a way the, the information is there. So we, it's not, I wouldn't keep it, um, I wouldn't keep it hidden, but the, um, there, there, there certainly are, pro, are many, many pitfalls. <laughs> I experience this in every jhana retreat I teach, where there are four jhanas, one, two, three, four. It sounds like a very progressive systematic practice, then some people can come to that retreat and think, well, this is a jhana retreat. I should get into jhana. If I don't get into jhana, then I am failing, or this practice is wrong, or not for me, or not, not of any use. And, um, that's just not a very useful attitude. Um, some people will say, okay, I'll be patient for one retreat or two retreats. But if I don't get into jhana by the third retreat, then I'm definitely going to quit and go find another practice or an easier practice or something that is more suitable to me. And, and again, it's, it's just placing the judgment in the wrong you know, in, in, uh, on the wrong criteria. Um, entering the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana, it, it's, just, it, it's just the wrong criteria. We can instead look for um, uh, the development of meditative skills, the deepening of concentration, an increased stability or equanimity of mind, a reduction of defilements, a sense that when the hindrances arise, 
we can be very skillful in letting them go, uh, a, a development of a refined skill in effort. So we can uh, not judge the practice based upon an attainment, but set our trajectory based upon an attainment, because that's a trajectory that's tried and true. You know, these these practices, these systems, the four jhanas, for example, or the four stages of awakening, they've been around for thousands of years. We're not like making them up, you know, just so that we can have a, a new four steps to kind of book or something. These have been around, they're tried and true. So that can be our, um, you know, our aim, our, 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 our trajectory, the direction we're pointed in. Um, but what really what we're looking for is what's happening in the present moment, not how, who do we imagine ourselves to be and what experience do we imagine having when we get to some, you know, a fantasy of a point at another point in our development. So we always have to work with where we're at, you know, what's actually happening in the present moment in our, in our experience now. Now, sometimes when people have the knowledge of the map, they come into the retreat as in the beginner, already having concepts of the end of the end, and their concepts are usually wrong. And they don't know it. I think, was it Tsongkhapa who said enlightenment turned out to be the opposite of what I expected? Um, somebody said that one great Tibetan master. <laughs> I like that quote. Enlightenment turned out to be the opposite of what I expected. Our expectations create an image, a concept of something, but it's not the experience. It's not the reality. It's not what is actually being known. So we can't really be, um, be living in a fantasy of our own attainments, comparing ourselves to these concepts. We have to work with the conditions at hand. So, yeah, I think it's true that these, um, these practices can sometimes, if, if we have the ideas too early and we fixate around them, then they, they, they can be a problem. They really can be. But, but I feel like they're already out there. They're already known. And uh, we might as well develop a clarity around them, a right view and understanding and wisdom for working with the path rather than to try to pretend that there's you know, no purpose to this or no goal to this or, or no stages. Yeah, that makes sense. And I really like, um, I really like the idea of a sort of end state or a goal really as something to orient yourself toward, to give you a direction or a trajectory. I think that's a really wonderful way to look at it. Uh, and they're very inspiring direct directions. I mean, incredibly inspiring. I mean, I, I love to just think, I mean, we all know the experience of a mind free from greed, hate, and delusion. We've all experienced that. It's just, we usually experience, an unenlightened person experiences it for short periods of time, maybe longer periods of time when there's samadhi or, or a continuity of mindfulness. But... Um, but, but then the defilements arise again. So we know that it's possible because we experience it for periods of time. But imagine what life would be like if those defilements never arose again. The peace, the joy, the ease, the clarity, the wisdom that would fill our lives. It's quite inspiring, I find. And similarly with the jhanas. I mean, when the mind is concentrated, we experience a very joyful, peaceful, equanimous, uh, healthy, fit, steady, efficient, flexible mind. And how, how wonderful, how beautiful that is. On that note, my next question, maybe our last question, but that's okay. Uh, my, I, let's sort of, if you would, I would love to just sort of talk brass tacks with you for the benefit of the lay people listening to this and who will be listening on video. Would you be willing to talk a bit about, you know, we've talked about awakening and, it's, and you've painted a very alluring picture of the sort of liberated mind and also the jhanic mind. Uh, so I wonder, 
Uh, and I think a lot of people wonder, for a regular lay person, someone with a job, a life, maybe even a family, um, is it feasible without doing a million years on retreat, leaving your life, you know, while still you know, upholding a lay person's responsibilities, is it feasible to achieve jhana? Is it feasible to achieve stream entry? And here's the part I'm really curious about. What does that actually look like? I would love to hear like, how much practice, how much formal practice uh, in debt, you know, sort of daily formal practice, what should informal daily life practice look like? Um, how much retreat does one have to do? Um, you know, can you paint a picture of, all right, so you're a lay person and you're actually kind of serious about stream entry, for instance, or jhana. Here's, here's what I recommend in a, in, in, in a sort of concrete sense. Okay. Um, well, if you're serious about your practice in any way, I would say from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep, watch the mind. And don't indulge in a defilement of any kind. We indulge the hindrances. We indulge the defilements all too often and make excuses for them. I don't think we have to leave lay life. I don't think we have to wear an orange robe. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, 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 um, an option for some people, but not for everyone. But anyone who is serious about their practice has to be serious about it, not only on the cushion, but in every moment of life. We need to be mindful of what the mind is doing and learn to respond skillfully all the time, you know, whenever, all the time. Just keep looking, looking and looking, watching and watching with interest and curiosity to want to have a direct and clear experience of this moment of life right now. And then this moment, and then this moment. And every time you find that your mind is responding to life in a way that you know very well is going to create more problems and suffering, you know, like getting angry or, or indulging in, in, um, in conceit and arrogance or haughtiness or, or, um, or greed or lying or breaking the precepts or making excuses for this and that, you know, all the stuff the mind does, then we deal with it right then and there, moment by moment throughout every day, we clean up our act. And as we clean up the way that we live and the way that we um, interact, and then the way that we experience our own minds, the way we respond to feelings and events, the way that we think, we're gonna find that the mind will be very calm when it sits down to meditate. Because so many um, of, the, of the issues of concentration are actually issues of the way that we use our minds. Are we, are we breaking the precepts and then feeling some agitation and restlessness? Then we have to make excuses for them or this or that. So if we, if we simplify and, and, um, and are willing to let go of a lot of personal preferences, personal attachments, views and opinions about this and that, all that, all that, all the stuff that causes um, agitation. Then when we sit down to meditate, the progress of the, the development will occur much more quickly. We'll still have to learn meditative skills. We'll need a suitable object. So we'll need to have the, the skills to determine how to approach our practice skillfully in terms of our aims. So if we're develop, if we if we're interested in jhana practice, we would need to meditate with the skills and in with a method and an object that has the potential to lead to absorption. And then um, develop that. Um, in my experience with students, I've found that if somebody has, um, has mastered the jhanas in retreat, that it's very possible to continue that at home. Um, I do find that it seems to be really uh, helpful to master them in retreat. Many times somebody comes to the retreat and tells me I'm doing jhana practice at home, but what they described to me is not what I would call jhana practice. So, um, so interacting with, with a qualified teacher, being able to check the states, master each one, develop the skills, learn the pathway, develop it efficiently, use it for the purposes that it was intended, have right 
right for you so that the concentration that we develop is right concentration. All of those things can be very much supported with a quali- working with a qualified teacher. But then people can go, people go home after the retreat. And many people can maintain it for at least some period of time, some days, some weeks, some months. And some people, though rare, some people for years or for the rest of their lives. And if somebody really does maintain it, the conditions generally mean that their life is relatively simple in the sense that they're not juggling a million things. Sure, working full time, having children, doing normal things like that. Yeah, taking care of elder parents. People are doing all of that, dealing with um, with illness in, in the family. Those are not unusual things. Those are, are part of our lives. And people can still do jhana dealing with those things. But some degree of... of, of of calmness in life really helps a willingness to let go and the willingness and discipline to sit every day um, and I would say most people that I know that are doing jhana practice real jhana practice deep jhana practice on a daily basis or in an at-home re- context are doing it are sitting at least two hours a day as their daily practice, somewhere two, three, maybe four hours, usually two, I'd say, would be what it would look like. That's not the case for everyone because you can't say jhana needs anything um, like X number of minutes. Um, But it does require um, that the mind is free from the hindrances. And it does require that there is a development of, 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 of a wholesome state so that the mind is very stable. And when those conditions come together with a suitable object and their skill, then one can enter an absorption. For myself, I find that it requires quite a bit of energy and resolve. Although it produces energy, it still requires that focused energy. And and I don't find that I actually want to do that every day. I don't, sometimes I just want to sit and relax, you know, be mindful of experience and be a lot more kind of uh, free and easy with the, with the daily meditation. I don't necessarily want to bring up that, that level of resolve to seclude the mind from all sensory, you know, to uh, eliminate all thought. Those are the conditions of absorption. There's no sensory input whatsoever. The mind is not processing sound or sensation. And the mind is not thinking about anything else. There's an absorption, a complete and powerful absorption with the meditative object. And I find that requires such energy and resolve. It just really isn't something that I either want to or feel I need to or would be able to, you know, use, um, on a daily basis. So um, I, uh, I think it's more common that somebody would deepen their concentration, but may or may not enter absorption depending on the day. And, but keep the mind kind of um, maintain access, maintain a, 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 a clear path, which basically means free from the hindrances. So that then when one goes into a retreat or, or takes a quiet day for meditation that, um, or brings up the resolve that the, that the experience, that this, that this, that state of, um, of calmness and tranquility would be available. Hmm. That's very interesting. Um, and I mean, I have so many things I want to ask you about on the basis of what you just said, but I'm going to restrain myself. Um, Though I wonder, would you, no, I'm not. Um, Will you um, answer just one quick thing? Because not to fixate on this, but, you know, my ears perked up when you actually put numbers on it. When you said, you know, for most people practicing jhana, you're going to see something like two or more hours a day. Are you able to, and I I think we, we can all agree not to quote you. You know, and that, but thank and that, you, thank you, thank you. I should have, should, I, I can only say that in, um, um, I really think people are all different. 
Yeah. But of, of the people that I know who tell me that they're doing jhana and their description of jhana matches what I would call um, a, a, a full absorption, um, those people are generally practicing two hours a day. Yeah. So I've, I've seen that over time. But I don't think that that's a necessary criteria. The criteria is, is that the mind is free from the hindrances yes. and that the various wholesome factors are well-developed and that the mind is capable of, of maintaining a, an absorption that's not forceful striving, but a settled absorption, a stillness that absorbs with a suitable meditation subject. Yeah. Now, um, um, I think we only hit a couple of your questions, though. You yeah. asked me about jhana, and you asked me about um, states of practice and paths. Was there another topic or something there, you want to just throw out it, quickly before people ask questions so we get the topics on the table? Yes, thank you. There was. I wanted, you know, um, just inspired by uh, the fact that you're doing this course on study of the suttas, of the, of the old Buddhist texts, um, I wonder what you feel the appropriate role of study and intellectual understanding um, is in the context of a yogi's practice. Okay, I'm glad I asked because I love this question. Um, um, I actually think it's really important to understand um, what the Buddha taught and not only what the Buddha taught, but um, what the traditions teach. We have the benefit of learning from thousands of years of practitioners. I don't think we need to just sit down and make it up and be creative and freewheeling with our practice. We can be really intelligent and still have the freedom to explore what is useful. Um, in our context, in a contemporary life, and in the context of our own minds and daily needs. Uh, so I think the Buddha taught um, a three, there's, there are three kinds of wisdom described in the Theravada tradition. In Pali, it's Sutta Maya Panya, Chinta Maya Panya, and Bhavana Maya Panya. Sutta Maya Panya is the wisdom, the Panya, that arises through hearing the teachings, we could say through reading the suttas. Um, Chintamaya Panya is a kind of wisdom that arises through reflection, through pondering, through discussion. And I think that's very much what we're going to be, you know, engaging in the questions and what we're having now is there's an understanding and a wisdom that can come by, by kind of grappling with the concepts and thoughts and ideas and experiences that we learn about. And then there's Bhavana Maya Panya, which is the wisdom that develops through the cultivation of our meditation and the cultivation of our practice. The Buddha didn't only teach meditation. He taught an integrated path that includes teachings. It includes discussion. It includes practice. And if we don't understand the value of all three, then our practice can get a little imbalanced. We might be sitting so so strongly that we think our own experience is the be all and end all of everything. And we don't have the information coming from the suttas. For example, we might end up cultivating one particular factor very strongly, say it's an awakening factor. Maybe it's tranquility or maybe it's joy or maybe it's some, I don't know what, equanimity or something. Um, and not, and without knowing the teachings, we may, think this is important. I'm developing it. My practice is developing it. And forget that there are seven factors of awakening, not only one. We might be cultivating something on the eightfold path and think this is the most important thing. But, but we might forget that there's an eightfold path. It's not a onefold path. So and as we read the suttas and as we, um, as we learn what the Buddha taught, it keeps expanding our knowledge beyond our experience so that we then get a wiser perspective on our own practice and on the experience of how we're engaging in this moment. How can we engage in this moment with the wisdom of the Dhamma? 
So we need to study that to the extent that we can apply it to our practice, but not, it's, it's not like an academic intellectual understanding that we're then gonna like get a quiz, pass the quiz, know the answers and uh, be all learned about. It needs to inform our practice and our practice is brought to our study and our study is brought to our practice. And, um, and then we also benefit from learning from each other. I love sutta studies in community. I love the discussions because although I've read the suttas again and again and again, I've been reading them regularly since, I guess I, 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 guess I only started reading them in 1990. Um, but I've been reading them regularly ever since. And even so, I may have read a sutta 20, 30, 40 times. And then I get into a different group of people to discuss it and something new shines out. You know, it might be I'm in a different place, but very often somebody uses different words to describe it, or there's an image, a simile that is just, um, that just describes some quality of the experience that illuminates it in a new way. And then I can bring that back into my practice, into the contemplation, so that I use the teachings of the sutta to further my meditative practice. So I, I think sutta study is really, really important. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big, big, big fan of it. Cool. Thank you, Shaila. That was interesting. Um, and I, and I, I do, I love the, I agree that it's goal, the goal of study is to inform practice, right? It's not this isolated, it's not uh, just done for sort of abstract enjoyment or to chew on concepts, but it's to inform the way that we live and we practice. Uh, I think that's really beautiful. All right, Q and A, yeah. Um, let's do it. So we're gonna we're gonna open it up. Um, if that's all right with you, Shyla. All right. So um, just fire away. Just start uh, sending those chats to me and letting me know that you have questions, and we will get started uh, with Bijan. Bijan, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Thank you. Hi, Shaila. Thanks so much for doing this and taking the time out of your day. So um, it, when you talked about practice and access concentration in jhanas and sort of everyday life and how, well, if you're able to bring attention and be aware of the mind and of the moments for every single day, then like you can do that in everyday life. It doesn't require going to a monastery. Um, I have a question in relation to difficult experiences of everyday life, specifically things like chronic pain, that I think very much for many people who experience chronic pain, bring up constant aversion. And it's very difficult because of the nature of pain or chronic pain to ever really move, like seclude or, or get, or, or, or really fully go away from the aversion. There always seems to be some inkling of the aversion of that pain there. So I was curious if you had any advice or um, path or, or like, I would not want to say trick, but just maybe the, the yeah advice of how to deal with something like chronic pain that is just always there and a big hindrance to uh, something like this. Well, at uh, first, in, um, in when there's chronic pain or, or intense pain, um, that's not a time that I would recommend undertaking jhana practice. It's a time when I would still um, recommend watching the mind with tremendous diligence. Um, from the moment one wakes up until the moment one goes to sleep, how are we responding to the present condition? Um, although, um, though the body might be feeling pain, um, the mind may be still able to access joy and happiness, peace and tranquility, equanimity and calmness, um, and respond to the situation of pain with wisdom. And even though um, it might feel as though the pain is always there, the pain is not always being known. So consciousness uh, picks up one object at a time 
and we know lots of things. You know, we see and the eyes aren't in pain. We hear, we smell, you know, the spaghetti cooking on the stove. And there are lots of moments in which there is something other than physical pain occurring. Um, so we can refresh the attention by learning to direct our attention in a variety of ways and being mindful when the attention is drawn to the pain, being mindful of, of how we're meeting that experience and be also mindful of the times when we are aware of other experiences and how are we meeting those experiences. The problem, even though it sounds hard to believe sometimes, the problem is not with painful feeling or pleasant feeling. Um, the, the challenge and the, the, the difficulty, the problem that, that makes the situation feel unbearable is, as you said, the aversion in the mind. Um, sometimes one can try to overcome aversion by, by having sensual desire for something else. Oh, let me get rid of this by improving that. Well, then you get two hindrances. So I don't really recommend that method. Um, I would instead suggest, first of all, being mindful of not only the pain, but other things, because that will break down the view that I am always in pain, because you're not always knowing pain. You know, every time you're tasting something, your tongue is not in pain. Every time you're hearing something, your ear is not in pain. Every time you're seeing something, your eyes are not in pain. So, so let your mind be refreshed with mindfulness of a wide variety of things. And then when your attention does move to the physical pain, make a clear distinction between the physical sensation, the unpleasant Vedana, the unpleasant feeling tone or affective quality, and the mental response. So you're mindful then of body of feelings and of mind. And the body will be something, you know, searing, burning, tingling, pressure, vibration, et cetera, something. Um, and, and that's pretty much largely probably bearable, unpleasant, but largely bearable. The feeling will be unpleasant. So the Buddha talked about feeling the unpleasant feeling, but feeling it without attachment, feeling it without the expectation that it be other than it is, feeling it with a mind of equanimity. And so the feeling could be unpleasant, the feeling could be pleasant, the feeling could be neutral, and the, the practice is to actually feel it, not to avoid it, but to feel it with a mind that knows the experience and knows it with equanimity. And then when we're looking at the mind and distinguishing, well, what is the, the mental? That's, when we're, we're, that's where we'll see the great danger of causing suffering. Because we know that if the mind starts to think of a lifetime of this pain and starts to resent why I can't do this and that and gets angry at the, what caused the pain and, and then is, um, is like, oh, why did this happen to me? We have like tremendous mental anguish. So we can work with the body, the feelings and the mind with mindfulness so that we don't bring in thoughts and mental states that make the experience of the body unbearable. This, this requires a lot of diligence, though. That's part of why I say from the moment we wake up until the moment we go to sleep, there are moments of life and they're not always pleasant, but there's always a mental response to it. Are we responding in a way that is going to bring us greater suffering or are we responding in a way that's going to, to bring a greater peace? Are we responding unwisely or wisely? And so we cultivate this capacity to bring wise attention to our experience. Now, this is not easy. This is an extremely demanding practice. But what have you got to lose? The alternative is to just hate your experience. And we know that doesn't lead to any happiness. So how can we meet the experience in a way that doesn't perpetuate hatred? that doesn't perpetuate fear, that doesn't perpetuate pity, 
that doesn't lead us down a, some kind of a road of, um, of, of suffering. And, you know, it's not going to be perfect. Uh, but you have another moment to work with and then another moment to work with and another moment to work with. Thank you so much, Shaila. That was great. <laughs> I appreciate it a lot. Thanks, Bijan. Thank you, Shyla. Um, Chappelle, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, hey, Shyla. Um, so my question is regards to like, you know, awakening, kind of like in daily life, like you talked to John about. Um, in terms of seeing the three characteristics, um, how would you approach that in like daily life or like on the cushion? Um, do you think a certain level of samadhi is necessary or like, would I be kidding myself if I just try to like focus on a characteristic all day long, like for say, like, you know, seeing impermanence all day long in my experience, you think that's like too surface level or you think um, that's good practice? I think we have to keep our practice interesting. And if it interests you and it's around seeing things as they are, then I would say it's good practice. Uh, but I wouldn't force the same form of practice all the time. I think we can see the characteristics of experience, particularly highlighting the impermanence of things. I think you're probably all aware that the three characteristics are the impermanence, anicca in Pali, the unsatisfactoriness, dukkha, and the um, um, not self characteristic, um, anatta. And I think it's the impermanence that is usually the most vivid. We can actually experience uh, things uh, changing. We can perceive them changing, increasing, decreasing, appearing, disappearing, being perceived and no longer being perceived. So um, we, can, we can see the, um, the, uh, the appearance and the vanishing of various aspects of body and mind. So I think it's a great thing to really highlight and notice in life. Um, in a systematic practice, there are a few different phases. And first we have to um, develop, as you said, uh, uh, a, enough stability of mind that we can see clearly. Because if the mind is clouded by the hindrances or agitated with restlessness, there's no capacity to see clearly or there's diminished capacity to see clearly. So we need enough stability that we can see clearly. And then what do we see clearly? Well, we need to look at our experience because if we misdirect our perception, we're not going to have the insight that we have won't be liberating. So we, um, so the, the objects that the Theravada tradition recommends for it, for insight practice is to discern the changing nature of body feelings and mind. We could say the five aggregates, um, the body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. But we're basically looking at this experience of what is known. So we're not contemplating the impermanence of a star in the sky or the impermanence of, well, yes, we can see it's changing and we can know it, but the, know that, that, that they're not impermanent that they're not permanent, but we're not doing an external kind of physics contemplation. We're, at, we're really looking at the experience of what is being known and how that experience of knowing is changing. Because this is the arena in which we identify. We identify with our experience. We cling to our experience. We become someone through that clinging to experience. So this is the realm in which we, these are the, this is the arena in which we, um, uh, develop the, the delusions. So this is where we're reinforcing an, an, a relationship to experience that causes suffering. So we look at these arenas of body, feelings, mind, of the five aggregates of experience. So we have now stability of mind, and we have looked at and discerned the objects of experience, the body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. And then we start contemplating them as anicca, as impermanent. We're now, we know what we're looking at. We understand what it is, how it functions. And now we can start to see how it changes. Some people try to jump too quickly to the perceiving the impermanence of things and don't develop enough stability or 
a clarity of the functioning of body and mind so that they might see things changing, but they don't get the wisdom out of it. But if we look at how um, a systematic practice such as the practice presented in the Visuddhimagga unfolds, we first develop some samadhi, some degree of stability. We discern the experience and then we contemplate it as impermanent. So that provides a more uh, kind of comprehensive approach to the practice that I think would um, facilitate the recognition of impermanence being liberating. Uh, Joe Blow on, on the street, everybody, you know, anybody you ask, is, is everything changing? They're going to say yes. So impermanence is not really a, 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 an idea that is reserved for Buddhists. Um, and it's certainly not something that the Buddha invented. Um, everything's changing. That's just how things are. Uh, but sometimes when people look at impermanence, they don't have a, an experience of clarity, wisdom, letting go and freedom in relationship to it. That freedom that comes by releasing the clinging around self, the demands of desire and aversion. An insight into impermanence is manifests through the, the not being and uh, not producing anger or lust, not needing to hold on. And so, but other people will experience and see something changing and their reaction will be to want to hold on or their reaction will be despair or depression or anger that it's changing. So it's a, it's a whole context in the Dharma practice of, in the in the in Buddhism that allows those insights into impermanence to be liberating. So yes, do contemplate impermanence in your daily life, but value the whole context so that that recognition of impermanence leads to the freedom that it's that that it has the potential to lead to the awakening that it has the potential to lead to and not to some kind of, 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 of despair or further trying to like, oh, everything's changing. So I'm going to hold on to my little piece of whatever. Um, does that make sense? Do you want to respond to that a little? Um, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, hmm. And yeah, you talked about impermanence, and I suspect like anatta and like suffering, still the same thing. The stability is what's required. Um, stability and clarity. Clarity. So it's the this, this, this stability of mind, but also the understanding, the clarity as to what we're seeing as impermanent. And as and because we're seeing, I link Anicca Dukkha and Anatta, and we find them often linked in the suttas, where uh, the Buddha asks, um, "Is what is, um, um, you know, basically he asks, is this permanent or impermanent?" And the monks say, "It is impermanent, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent of suffering or happiness? It is suffering, venerable sir. Is what is." Um, impermanent and suffering fit to be called self, no venerable sir. So through seeing the impermanence of things, we realize it's dukkha in the sense that it's not a reliable basis for lasting happiness, it doesn't bring peace. And so it's unreliable in that sense. It's unsatisfactory in that sense. And it's anatta, it's not self, because we have no control over it. You know, it's just arising and passing due to nature, causes and conditions. It's not myself and I can't control it. It's just, it's following its own natural laws of cause and causes and effects. So it's, it's not self. It's not something that we can impose our will on. It's not something that truly exists as, a, um, as, an, as an entity as such. So, um, so we, we then, um, there's great insight that comes through this because we develop a kind of clarity and ease with perceiving the changing nature of causes and conditions. So instead of always having to fixate on concepts, we see changing nature of pro various processes and it, it really loosens the attachments and the grasping. Awesome, thank you. 
Thanks, Chappelle. Thank you, Shyla. Uh, so uh, I here, I'll drop you out of here. Um, so I have a, a question here uh, that was written. Uh, this person is a fan of your work on jhanas and is wondering if there are any other jhana teachers alongside yourself that you would highly recommend. Um, I appreciate the question, but on an internet forum like this, I'm going to choose to not answer. Fair enough. Because anybody that I mentioned um, would also reflect on, oh, why didn't she mention so-and-so? And then so-and-so. Yeah. And then you get into this weird thing about second-guessing. What are the agreements or the disagreements or the, 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 the contradictions? Um, there are um, a, a lot of different descriptions and definitions of jhana. And if you do choose to practice with multiple teachers, which can be very beneficial to not just like be in some narrow single view, um, it can be very helpful to, to um, check that the practices are not contradictory, that the objects are uh, and the basic pattern and practice of uh, the unfolding is that there aren't contradictory um, instructions um, and that the practices just are somewhat compatible. I mean, there's differences in style of teacher, that doesn't matter. Um, there can be differences in um, uh, depth or sustainability or, or that, that, that all, all also doesn't matter so much. Um, but I do think one shouldn't, it, there's not much value in in, in trying to con practice in contradictory systems. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you for sharing that, Shiloh. Sorry to put you on the spot like that. Um, uh, let's see. So, the, okay, so I, I'm gonna ask you a question actually while we wait for more questions to come in and then we have a repeat, we have a repeat offender who wants to ask a question and who if no other questions come in, can definitely do so. Um, so, but I, but I'm going to, I'm going to seize the mic for a second. Um, you talked about, you, you've exhorted us to watch the mind all the time from the morning we wake, from when we wake up in the morning to when we go to sleep at night. Uh, when you say watch the mind, I wonder if you could elaborate on that because, you know, for instance, I know a lot of people who, and I myself, practice in a way that's influenced by the teachings of Mahasi Sayadaw, that particular Burmese strain of, of practice. Uh, and it's not always watching the mind. Sometimes it's, uh, it's watching the, you know, the, the, what's appearing at the various sense doors and not just the mind door. I wonder, does that, so if, for instance, you, you know, I'm noting the presence of various sensations coming and going, sounds coming and going, along with mental objects like, yes, uh, intentions, cravings, aversions, um, thoughts, and so forth. Uh, is, is that what you mean? Or when you say watch the mind, do you mean really focus on the mind door in a particular way? Would you mind elaborating or clarifying? Um, no, I... I think it's very valuable to when the attention is drawn to seeing that we're mindful of seeing and when the attention is drawn to hearing or sensation that we're mindful of that and that when we're eating we're mindful of the response of the touch or the warmth of the food in our mouth or we're mindful of the flavor and the different flavors but um, I, I'm not convinced that that would be liberating. I think um, in that moment of seeing, not only would we be aware that we're seeing, we, sh we would know the state of mind that is arising in that moment of seeing. And in that moment of hearing, we would know that state of mind. Well, in that moment of hearing, or were we just, uh, you know, we don't want to, I don't see the value of going around the world going, hearing, touching, seeing, and, and, and it all being external. 
but it's perfectly possible to have um, a recognition of seeing and use the mental note, seeing is happening, but we are knowing not only the visible object and the color, but we are knowing the response to it. Are we seeing with wisdom? Are we seeing with equanimity? Are we seeing with a balanced mind? Or are we seeing with greed and hate and anger and delusion and conceit and jealousy? I mean, what's happening in that moment of seeing? So when I say watch the mind, I agree all the sense doors are included. But what is the mental response to all of the sense doors? Can we meet the sense doors with mindfulness that is not so focused only on the object, but also is mindful of the external object, the internal experience, the, the sensitivity in the body to it, the feelings, that moment of contact, the consciousness, the knowing, the mental state, the, is that state wholesome? Is it unwholesome? The quality of attention, the quality of energy, the, is it pleasant, unpleasant feeling? All the stuff that goes in to that moment of cognition, of seeing, of hearing. Um, because the transformation, we're not going to change the colors in the world. We're, we don't need to. We don't need to change the sounds in the world. Um, but we certainly have a responsibility to clean up our own response to the world. Are we responding with hatred and anger to the things that we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and feel and experience and think, et cetera? Or are we responding with wisdom and um, compassion? Thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Um, all right, so Chappelle wants to ask another question and that seems kosher to me. Chappelle, you wanna ask your question? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, I, I was wondering your thoughts around um, Kanaka Samadhi um, and how it, I guess, compares to like, I don't know, more developed Samadhis. Um, it's kind of like my understanding that Kanaka or momentary concentration, um, like the hindrances, they, they kind of find a way to sneak in, but if you develop like some giant concentration, the adherences are just like kind of walled off. Um, but I also hear that Kanaka Samadhi could be pretty uh, powerful and useful um, towards uh, like liberation and insight. Um, so I just wanted to know your view on using Kanaka Samadhi. Okay. Um, so uh I, I assume most of the people are somewhat familiar with the language since you use it so, uh, so freely and correctly. The um, Kanaka Samadhi is the Pali term that's usually translated as momentary concentration. And it's usually a, um, it's, it basically is developed during insight practice or mindfulness practice where the, where the object keeps changing. So we're experiencing then the arising and passing of feeling or the, or, the, or the changing nature of sensation or the changing mind state. So we're mindful of, of various things. And in any moment, we might be observing a different object and a different object and a different object and then a different object and then a different object. And yet the state of mind is still concentrated. There's a sense of unification, even though the object changes, an experience of undistractedness, even though the object changes. And Kanaka Samadhi is not a lesser kind of Samadhi than um, what's called Apana Samadhi, which is a fixed concentration, or Jhana, which described the four states of meditative absorption using fixed objects. Um, it, it, Kanaka Samadhi is in no way a lesser kind of Samadhi. In fact, it can be tremendously powerful and indeed is the type of concentration that develops with insight practice because with insight practice, the objects are, 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 are the, the, the experience of the five aggregates, which is continuously changing. That's contrasted to Apana Samadhi and Jhana practice where there is a fixed object usually uh, uh, usually a concept, a mental object. So it's not, um, it's not the changing nature of feeling 
or the changing nature of the body. In, um, in a meditative absorption, one is not observing change and the object needs to be one that is suitable for absorption, hence a mental object concept. So, um, so the, the, the nature of what type of samadhi has a lot to do with the object that one is concentrating on, that one is knowing in that moment. Um, I don't make a hierarchy of one being better than the other or one being stronger than the other because somebody really can develop intensely strong and sustained undistracted um, so, uh, experience with kanaka samadhi. And one can, if one's mindfulness is continuous, the hindrances won't find a way in with kanaka samadhi. The, the, the challenge is the continuity of the mindfulness. Anytime we meet an experience with mindfulness, it's like the, the hindrances can't quite get, there, get a foothold. Uh, so uh, the, we, the hindrances arise when there's a slip in the mindfulness. So, um, so we might then realize a hindrance came in, become mindful or aware of that, and then that hindrance falls away. So it can feel like because of the slips in the mindfulness, it can feel as though the hindrances, as you said, sneak in. But it's, that's more a reflection of that the subtle moment of the loss of, of, of mindfulness. Uh, the mind, the attention is distracted by something. And often that something is uh, some thought of self or some conceiving of, of, of some, some, some brief perspective of delusion that creeps in. But in an intensive retreat, um, you know, say somebody is sitting for months, uh, a two month retreat, a three month retreat, and there's a real momentum of the mindfulness that has developed, uh, one can easily experience uh, a days and weeks without the hindrances, finding an opportunity. Um, whereas with jhana, it's true that the um, jhana can, through the care, through the absorption with that object, make it much easier to experience states in which the mind is free from the hindrances. In fact, jhanas are described as being states in which Mara, the personification of the hindrances and the Lord of the sense realm, is. Uh, blindfolded or can't find an entry because in an absorption in a jhana absorption there there are no perceptions of the sensory experiences of the body or sounds or or and there's no other thoughts so there's no way for that hindrance to enter into the jhana first the jhana needs to break and then there could be an opportunity the meditative absorption would need to be be, be breached for there to be a, a possibility for a hindrance to arise. So in that sense, it feels much more secluded because it's secluded from the sense perceptions. It's secluded from the, um, the, the various kinds of hindrances and unwholesome states. Um, so um, I guess you could say that the mind feels in that sense, um, a walled off as though there's, um, and this this re this range in which the mind is um, experiencing that absorption uh, just has no way for the hindrances to arise. What I do think is important is that we uh, uh, refrain from thinking one form of samadhi is inherently better than another or creating some kind of hierarchy. Um, those are the kinds of, of things that then then the sense of the deluded sense of self could become attached to it and think, I got this good one <laughs> and I'm going to hold on to it and, 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 and to do this. And that person, they can't do it. So they're not, they're no, they're not as good as I am. And, and that then becomes a, a basis for more delusion and conceit. In, um, in the actual experience of samadhi and vipassana, once we change the object, the type of samadhi changes. So one can um, uh, be doing, uh, do a mindfulness practice uh, and through the mindfulness, uh, settle the hindrances, um, develop the, the conditions for absorption, enter into the absorptions, sustain the absorptions for some time, some hours, 
and uh, where the mind is completely free from the hindrances and emerge from that absorption and now begin to see, hear, smell, taste, touch. And as one brings mindfulness to the senses, um, to the five aggregates, to the experience of body and mind, it's not like we have lost our samadhi or lost our concentration, but because the object has changed, the type of concentration is now described as kanaka samadhi rather than the, the type of jhana concentration. But kanaka samadhi supported by having just in the purity of the mind that has just emerged from the absorption states actually can be powerful. I mean, tremendously powerful. It's not jhana concentration, but it is supported by the, the previous experience of jhana and now is being applied to various changing objects. So it is now, it, it is manifesting as kanaka samadhi. And that can continue to build and grow strong and be a very, very powerful um, condition that can lead to liberating insight. Thanks, that was really clear. All right. Um, thanks, Chappelle. And thank you, Shyla. Uh, so, all right. I think that was actually our last question. So we might wrap a little early, which I don't think has ever upset anyone. If you benefited from this or enjoyed it, I really encourage you to offer Donna uh, to Shyla. Donna is, um, here, let me put myself back up. Uh, Donna, uh, is a, a word in Pali that refers to donations given in the spirit of generosity and gratitude for the teachings. Shyla, any final things that you want to say before we um, say goodbye for the evening? No, just good wishes for your practice. Thank you, Shyla. Thank you so much for being here with us. I enjoyed this immensely. Uh, and learned a lot and I'm walking away inspired to practice diligently from when I open my eyes in the morning to when I close them at night. Uh, so wishing myself luck on that. Um, and please come back uh, and spend time with us again sometime. Okay, so, great. thank you. Thank Enjoy you very much. Thanks thank everyone for joining us. Good night. Thank you, Shyla. Thank you, thank you so much.